Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education at Brandeis University. I'm John Levison. I'm director of the center, and I'm delighted to be launching this new series of conversations with scholars of Jewish education. We created this series as a way to share new or recent scholarship in the field of Jewish education with a broad audience. Sometimes uh, it will be scholarship that's supported directly by the Mandel Center or projects that are under the umbrella of the Mandel Center and sometimes work by colleagues in our field that we think is particularly important and relevant to uh, people in the field of Jewish education. We know that there's great work being done, great scholarship in Jewish education, but it's often not very accessible. It's often hidden away in academic articles that are written for other scholars. And even when it's written in a more accessible way, it's not always obvious why people in the field of Jewish education should care about it. At the Mandel Center, we are committed to developing and promoting scholarship in Jewish education, especially scholarship on teaching and learning in Jewish education in order to make a deep and lasting difference on the lives of learners and the vibrancy of the Jewish community. That's our mission. So this new series is a way of serving our mission by getting ideas out into the world. Each of these sessions will be conducted as a conversation between the particular scholar and me. And each one will be really quick, just 30 minutes to talk about one article or sometimes one book or one project. We're delighted to have so many of you joining us live and we hope to be able to take some questions uh, from you as we go. Um, feel free to post those questions using the Q and A uh, button at the bottom of the screen. And we're also recording today's session and we'll make the recording available afterwards on our website for those who couldn't join us today. Our guest today the first for the first session of this series is my good friend and colleague here, Brandeis Jonathan Krasner. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on Jonathan's bio, uh, that's all available online, but I do wanna mention that um, in addition to writing terrific award-winning uh, books and articles, Jonathan is also one of those scholars who's deeply involved with Jewish educational organizations and institutions. He's taught in Jewish day schools. He's been involved with Jewish camps. He teaches in the Jewish community. He was a founder of Keshet and he, uh, he now sits on the board of Moving Traditions. Jonathan, it's great to be with you today. Wonderful to be here, John. And i um, so happy to help uh, launch uh, what I hope will be uh, a really wonderful program. Great. So we're, we're talking today about um, your article, which you recently completed, which is called, uh, the title I, I believe is Ramah in Transition, the Sheldon Dorf Years, which is about the national uh, Camp Ramah system in the 1990s. It's going to appear in the forthcoming volume. Um, I think the title is Ramah at 75. Is that right? That is the working title. So I'm that's the working title. And, and Ramah has published a number of these. There's been a series of volumes produced by the National Ramah Commission um, that look back at, um, at various aspects of, uh, of the history of Ramah. I want to start um, by talking for just a minute about your methodology as an historian. I'm a, I'm a philosopher. So when I do research in Jewish education, I think about a particular conceptual problem. And I read what other people have written about that problem. And then I, I develop my argument that way but you're an historian. So tell us what this kind of research looks like. Yeah, that's a great question, John. So I was initially interested in uh, this research project in part because the 1990s have uh, been understood or, or um, we've been uh, discussing over the past few years uh, the 1990s as a real turning point um, in the Jewish community with uh, the 1990 population study um, and what has come to be known as the continuity movement. Um, and I wanted to look at the way in which the context, namely uh, this uh, continuity movement had an impact on various systems and uh, certainly 
the camping system was one of those systems. And, um, and so when the uh, occasion um, presented itself, uh, I jumped at the opportunity to write about Ramah, but as you kind of intimated, um, I was in a bit of a quandary because unlike, let's say my, my book on uh, Jewish education in the early 20th century, most of the people who I'm writing about in this article are alive and well. Um, and one needs to be somewhat sensitive to that. Um, likewise, uh, it isn't as if a lot of the documentation um, that I was relying on already uh, exists in archival institutions. Um, and so uh, I think di to directly answer your question, um, I was able to rely on interviews in a way that I wouldn't necessarily be able to um, if I were writing about a subject uh, from a long time ago. So that was a real advantage. But I did want to make sure, since we all know that people's memories are fallible, I didn't want to make sure that I had a documentary record as well. And so um, one of the reasons why I agreed to do this article is because um, Sheldon Dorf kept his files um, and those were made available to me. Um, and so I was able to check what I was hearing against a paper record. So I felt a little bit more comfortable about that. Uh -huh. That's great. Um, so, so now let's turn to what you actually learned from doing, uh, from doing the work. So what happened uh, to Camp Ramah in the 1990s at the kind of 30,000 foot level? What's, what's the big story here? So the thing that you need to understand going into this is that Ramah's early heyday was really the 1950s and the 1960s. And that um, Ramah experienced uh, tremendous growth. There was real educational fermentation um, during that period. Um, and then for a variety of reasons, um, some of them having to do with an eco the economic downturn um, and uh, inflation in the 1970s, and some of it having to do with just uh, the end of the baby boom and, and fewer campers. But for a variety of reasons, um, the camping movement in general kind of fell on hard times. And this particularly hit Ramah um, because Ramah had expanded really quickly in the 1960s. Um, and so they were forced to close a camp um, and, and they were really kind of treading water, I think for uh, about a decade or a decade and a half, certainly the cost of insurance went up and you know they, they were really having a hard time. Um, and as a result of that, um, the facilities uh, went into disrepair, uh, the, uh, the educational vision itself um, was, was kind of in stasis. Um, and so with the advent of the 1990s, um, what we see is a real revitalization of the Ramah system um, due to, I think, the new energy that uh, Shelley Dorf uh, brought, as well as uh, a, an economic environment that, that was certainly um, much more robust than it had been before, uh, and um, uh, you know, more money being uh, flowing into the system. Um, and, and so that story, I think, that revitalization story was 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 part, is part of what we should be looking at. Um, yeah. But I think that if we, we dig just a little bit further, um, I think what we see is a camp system that was responding not only to these economic factors um, and these demographic factors, but was also trying to redefine itself in response to changes within the Jewish community. So, yeah, so that's what I wanted to ask you. Yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to drill down on that because, because you know, when we, we picture sort of the, the maybe a golden age of, of Ramah, 50s and 60s, this is a whole generation later um, and the conservative movement looks different a generation later. And I'm not at all discounting the importance of the economic factors and, and some of the demographic, demographic factors as well. But I'm really interested in the questions around vision and the evolution of that vision and especially Shelley's, um, Shelley's influence there in the 90s. Yeah, so I would say that one of the main uh, transformations that took place, and I, I wouldn't say that it happened overnight, 
And I wouldn't even say that Shelley alone was responsible for this, um, but uh, certainly as a shorthand, we can say that the Dorf administration was a time in which one saw a change from a movement that had traditionally been uh, a very elite focused camping movement, a movement that was first and foremost about training the future leaders of the conservative movement um, to a more mass camping movement, a camping movement that was interested in all comers, um, anyone who had uh, you know, the, uh, uh, some Jewish education or had some Jewish connection. I believe that the, uh, you know, the registration document still asked whether you were a member of a, of a synagogue or a temple. Um, so there was, there was some sort of barrier, at least uh, theoretically for entry. Um, but by and large, um, they were casting a much, much wider net. And not only were they interested in uh, touching more kids, um, they were also interested in reaching more conservative Jews and Jews more generally. And so the work of the camp extended not only uh, to those you know, eight or nine weeks over the summer, but you began to see retreats for families. You began to see uh, Passover holiday retreats. Um, you began to see uh, the camping movement being involved in synagogue revitalization efforts. So um, really what you're seeing here is a camping movement that is redefining itself um, and repositioning itself. Um, That's really and, and, and some of that was, I, I think some of that was, uh, came naturally. Um, and I think some of it was really difficult because it went against some ingrained, I think, uh, traditions um, that were valued by the folks at the center of the Raman wow. movement. Um, yeah. and, and they had to contend with that. So, so this is really interesting, Jonathan. I think when, when uh, you know, those of us who are, are thinking about the camp, the camping movement, Rama, but others as well in the last generation, um, uh, maybe it's a it's an assumption that's uh, accepted that of course camps are going to be wide open. Of course they're going to be um, trying to draw enrollment as as broadly as possible. But you're naming that this was actually a transition, and then the earlier years there was this much more elite conception of what camp was going to be all about. And and at some in some way this was a this was a transitional point. So um, so say some more about the tensions that emerged in. Uh, in this in this moment when there were these tr transitions happening? So I think that one of the tensions is uh, really that um, in order to undergo this kind of transformation process, one needs to look at oneself in the mirror um, and be honest about what you see. Um, and that means, I think, kind of slaying some sacred cows. Um, for example, the Ramah movement had always prided itself as being a Hebrew speaking camp. Um, yet anyone who actually went to a Ramah camp, um, and here I would say there was certainly a difference between Wisconsin, which was a much more Hebrew rich camp. And you know I, I don't wanna name names, but some of the other camps that were a little bit um, less Hebrew rich, um, but no matter which camp you went to, what you would find is what my colleagues Sharon Avni and Sarah Benor and I call Hebrew infusion rather than an immersive Hebrew environment. Um, and I think that uh, the camps had to come to terms with the reality as it existed rather than the story that they like to tell themselves about what was happening at their camps. And, you know, Hebrew is just one example of that, but I think it's a very potent example of that. Um, I think the so other- Just yeah, so go ahead. to make sure everybody understands. So you, you uh, in, that, in that example, you do talk about Hebrew in the paper, but in that example, you're also drawing on your other scholarship, the book Hebrew Infusion that, that, um, that was co-authored, uh, you and, and Sarah Benor and Sharon Avni. Um, that was published what last year um, and right. uh, and won an award and uh, only Ramah is important in that story as well as a bunch of other camps. Um, 
uh, and everybody should should absolutely take a look at uh, at that as well. Um, tell me more about the tension between kind of centralization. If 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 uh, Shelley Dorf is trying to move the movement in a particular way uh, from the kind of central office, um, the tension between the between a centralization and a much looser confederation of camps as that evolved in the nineties. Right. So. Uh, just a little bit of background. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Ramah system, um, it's important to understand that Ramah camps developed, um, some of them developed independently, like for example, in Wisconsin, you had a group of rabbis who started the camp, but really from the outset, the Jewish Theological Seminary was heavily involved in the camp, certainly um, in terms of staff, in terms of the educational program, um, over time, though, uh, what ended up happening is that each camp really developed its own independent personality, its own board, um, and was also responding to the fact that Judaism looks different, let's say, in California than it does um, in New York. Um, and what Dorf was presented with was a system that was really more like a confederation um, and less like a movement. And he really felt that in order to bring Ramah forward, um, he needed to bring the various camps together on the same page. Um, and, and, and I think that he will admit, and I certainly um, show this in the, in the paper, he was only partially successful in, in this. Um, but uh, he did make great strides and, and certainly um, his successor, Mitch Cohen, has continued in, in that vein. I think that um, each of the camp directors and especially the, uh, the camp boards, um, they really sort of put themselves first. And what Shelley was trying to show them is that if you wanted to sort of attract big money um, and if you wanted to create a, uh, a reputation for the Rama movement that you needed to act in concert. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I think we could talk about specific examples. There was uh, the example for, uh, of uh, Rama Magazine, um, which Shelley thought would be a great PR uh, device. Um, but of course, what ended up happening is that each camp had a different vision of the Rama that it wanted to see in the magazine. And things really kind of blew up uh, when they published an issue on women's ordination uh, and uh, female rabbis at camp. Um, and one has to remember that uh, the conservative movement only began ordaining women in the 1980s. So, and this was the 1990s. So it was really only a decade after the ordination of women. Um, and there were parts of North America that were, let's say more on the wagon. And there were ones that were, you know, parts of America that were less, uh, progressive on the issue of egalitarianism and Canada in particular yeah. um, was less egalitarian. And uh, the notion of a magazine that would be devoted to women's ordination and the role of women rabbis at camp um, for Camp Ramah in Canada, which wasn't in fully egalitarian camp, um, you know, that, that seemed like, why are we spending money on this? This is not the Ramah that, that we even recognize. So, right. so there were real tensions there. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think it's, it's also helpful to think about this time period as um, in, a lot of, in a lot of different Jewish educational uh, organizations, institutions as one of, um, of uh, increasing professionalization, increasing um, uh, consolidation in national organizations, so in the day school movement went through something similar, going from kind of individual mom and pop shops to being more tightly connected um, through the agency of Peach. Um, so, so there was, camps were not, and Ramah was not the only institution that was experiencing this tension of having grown up with a bunch of smaller uh, local institutions with a lot of control to starting to see themselves as part of a bigger movement for better, but sometimes also for worse. Absolutely. Um, the process that Shelley initiated, the centralization process, I think 
um, was facilitated, you know, it, it was brought to a new level, I would say, with the influx of foundation um, uh, investment, because, you know, the Avichai Foundation or the Jim Joseph Foundation or the, you know, FJC, uh, the Foundation for Jewish Camp, they didn't want to deal with each individual camp. They wanted to deal with, you know, the figurehead who was going to speak for the movement as a whole. Um, and uh, I, I think that the camps realized that they could maintain their individual identities while at the same time um, coming together for some larger purposes that would benefit everyone. Um, I think one of the other things that happened, and here's another way that Shelley was responding to the moment, um, is that he diversified what camp looks like um, and embraced the idea of specialty camps um, at a time when that was really only beginning um, in the camping world. I think now we take for granted, in part, I think because of FJC's um, incubator, that you're going to have sports camps and you're going to have arts camps and you're going to have, you know, eco uh, farming camps and all these sorts of things. Shelley was really at the uh, vanguard um, in, in that process. And, and, you know, he believed, and even though he didn't, his administration didn't, um, actually open the uh, Ramah Outdoor Adventure, uh, the Ramah and the Rockies camp. Um, it was on the drawing board um, and Shelley was very much behind it. And I think that you know, his attitude was camp in the Rockies will look different than let's say camp in New England will look different than camp in California. And that's totally fine, right? Right, right. So that's fascinating that on the one hand, there's a certain degree of centralization, but it's not homogenization. It's not that everybody has to look alike. If anything, the effort to say camp ought to be for everyone, if camp is going to be for everyone, not just for an elite, then we have to also think about kind of varying the, the models uh, and, and not holding to just one standard. And we say, this is what a Ramah has to look like. This is how, you know, this is what Ramah campers have to look like, what staff has to look like, what the educational program has to look like. It doesn't always have to fit exactly. that exactly. Exactly. And I'll give you one more quick example of that, which is another sacred cow that he had to slay, which was eight week camping. Ramah had been uh, really devoted to this notion of eight week camping, which in my mind, whether they realized it or not, was probably very much influenced by the polio epidemic um, in the late 40s and early 50s, um, when you needed to get the kids out of the city for the entire summer. Um, and, you know, in some years there weren't even visitors days. I think we can relate to that now with COVID um, because you didn't want to infect the kids. Um, but then over, over time, what was maybe a necessity, um, you know, that, that was, uh, you know, sort of uh, foisted on the camps because of the environment, um, became kind of the dogma of the camps. And what Shelley realized was that it was okay if Ramah, California had three week sessions and it was okay um, you know, if a sports camp had a two week session. Um, yeah, I, I don't wanna pretend that he was happy about it. I think that there was a part of Shelley, there is a part of Shelley that was still sort of a little bit of a traditionalist, um, but he recognized that uh, one size doesn't fit all. So I want to turn to the question of um, what really surprised you, and we've actually had a couple of questions um, already in the in the um, from our audience. Um, where I know you you want to talk about Ramad de Rome and a couple of the questions about Ramad de Rome. So so what what surprised you in this research as you as you started to open up the books and talk to people? Yeah, so you anticipated my answer here. What surprised me was the drama around the opening of Ramah de Rome, which is uh, the Ramah camp um, in Northern Georgia. Um, this was the first camp, uh, the first new camp that Ramah had opened in over two decades. Um, and it came to symbolize uh, Shelley's desire to expand, um, to move forward. Um, and I think that on paper, once uh, people felt confident that the other camps were uh, filling, uh, you know, their their beds. Um, I think that in, you know people felt like, in theory, it was a really great idea to open up a camp um, in a part of the country that was underserved, um, and uh, you know, and, and and many of those kids from the south had to go all the way up 
to Ramah New England and, and hopefully this would solve the problem. But actually, when it actually came to doing it, it was very, very difficult. Um, and it wasn't even the money that was the problem because they managed to attract a, a number of large donors, um, including Mayor Bubba Mitchell and, and Leonard Kaplan, um, whose names I have to mention because they, they were really, uh, you know, sort of the builders of, of, of that camp. Um, so it wasn't even really the money. Um, they also uh, had a lot of, um, of, of lay leaders uh, like, like Eric Singer who were devoted to opening up that camp. The problem was that there was infighting um, within the conservative movement, um, both between the United Synagogue and the Jewish Theological Seminary um, about whose, you know, whose footprint would, would uh, be largest down in the South that had traditionally been um, uh, United Synagogue territory and now uh, the Ramah movement was moving in on, on, on that territory and, and I guess presumably those donors. Uh, and at the same time, there was an, you know, sort of intercamp argument between uh, Ramah New England, which I had mentioned had those Southern kids going to the, its camp um, and their fear that they would lose campers if Ramah to Rome opened. And finally, and, and with, with much sort of back and forth, um, a compromise was reached where the catchment areas of the various camps were redrawn so that uh, Ramah, New England would have more kids from the New York area basically to compensate for the kids that it was gonna lose from the South. And that's why, for example, if you live, let's say, uh, I don't know, north of uh, I-287 in the New York area, even though Ramah Berkshires is a lot closer to where you live, you're actually going to Ramah, New England rather than Ramah okay. Berkshires. So we only have a couple minutes left and, um, and, uh, and as we knew, we were gonna run out of time really, really quickly. Um, there are some great questions, for example, um, if we had more time, I'd love to hear more, your perspective more uh, on the question of inclusion and varieties of inclusion in Ramah camps. But, um, but my last question that I wanna close with is, uh, is what we learned from this case. What do we learn from the case of Ramah in the 90s? Um, and why does it matter? Why does this particular scholarship matter? Why, why does Camp Ramah in the 90s matter? Yeah, so um, I wanna say, I, I realize we only have two minutes left, so I'll say 20 seconds here. Um, the uh, pioneering work of Tikva, which is the inclusion program at Ramah, was I think really uh, instrumental um, in helping Shelley to realize that Ramah could reach lots of different audiences. And, and certainly not only did he grow Tikva during that period, introducing it to more camps and serving um, more uh, kids who, who were um, in need of Tikva, um, but he also used it as an example of how Ramah could diversify. Um, but to answer your question, uh, I think that looking at this camp movement gives us a much more complex understanding of how uh, Jewish continuity affected various sectors of uh, the Jewish education world. Um, I think that it also gives us a, a different view of camping than, than quantitative surveys. We've had a number of surveys that were done, um, certainly Limud at the Lake, um, which was done by our colleagues um, at the Cohen Center. Um, uh, Leonard Sachs and, and Amy Sales played an important role um, in showing that camp could be uh, a uh, significant and, and um, I, I think vital uh, uh, site for Jewish education. Um, but I think that the kind of historical research that I did um, really, I think, gives us a more nuanced view of what was actually going on on the ground. And um, I think that looking at Ramah helps us, I think, to understand what happened, you know, the in the next decade with the growth of, of the Foundation for Jewish Camp. Wonderful. Um, that's, that is great. Um, Jonathan, I want to thank you for joining me. Um, it's great to talk with you about, uh, about this work. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to encourage everyone to join us again next month 
uh, for the next conversation in this series, which will be with uh, Professor Laura Yaris of Michigan State University. And you can find out more about that um, on, um, on the Mandel Center website. I also wanna encourage everyone to take a look at our upcoming online conference about online Jewish education, which is uh, being convened by our colleagues Eva Hassenfeld on October 26th and November 2nd. That's also, uh, information about that is also available on the uh, Mendel Center website. Um, and with that, thank you all for joining us um, and be well. <laughs>